the other one over this way. So you can oh. say, oh, I'm not. Testing, one, two, three. <coughs> <coughs> I'm going to get this test Gotcha. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight on <laughs> what? I'm like locking it up. Oh. <laughs> but she can tune in whenever she wants. Um, so I have been in the book of Numbers lately in my reading through the Bible, and I finished, um, gosh, where was I last? I don't really remember. I don't remember where I was. But nothing like major stood out. So now I'm in the book of Numbers, and I'm actually uh, 22 through 25. And I just found it really, really interesting, the um, kind of this thing that aspired through this, through this time. It's, you know, Numbers is talking about the Israelites, their lineage of taking a census of everybody that is in the land of the wilderness and who will be entering into the promised land. So there's a lot of names and how many people, and it just goes on and on. And most people, I think, just kind of like skip through all of it. But this one area in the middle is kind of just kind of takes this, you know, course in the center when it's talking about the king of Moab. Um, the king of Moab, who was, let's see if I can get some of these names right. <laughs> Balak, B-A-L-A-K, I'm going to say Balak. And so he was the king of Moab, and he realized that the Israelites were uh, kind of large, like massive large in number, and they were making their way towards him, and they were taking over these smaller, you know, the, these smaller lands and taking over um, kings and things like that. So he was uh, getting pretty worried. And so I found it interesting that he calls on a prophet and um, <laughs> who was Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M. So I'm going to say Balaam. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but that's what I'm saying. All right. And he calls on him and he's like, uh, there's like all these people and they're making their way towards me and you need to curse them and they need to go away. And so, of course... Uh, Balaam is like, okay, uh, well, I need to uh, consult God on this. You know, I'm not just going to do what you tell me to do. So the very beginning of 22 is him pretty much, uh, yeah, no, I'm not coming, you know. And then he sends a group and, you know, the group tells him, no, we're not coming. And then he sends another group and they say the same thing pretty much. Hey, you need to come. You know, it says, you know, we'll give you all of this silver and gold, gold and, re, and reward you. And he says, even if Belek were to give me a house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. And so pretty much him saying, no, I'm not doing this. Well, God comes to him and says, um... So I found this very interesting. So this is a, an area that kind of really stood out to me because this is how God wants us to really pay attention to what he is saying, how he is saying it, and making sure you're not doing things under your own uh, 
own thought process or your own opinion or your own kind of, well, you know, I don't know if I really heard that right, but this is what makes sense to me. So God is, to me, this stands out of God saying, you need to really pay attention to what I'm telling you to do. And so here it says, now please, as you, and this is uh, chapter 22, verse 19. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will say to me. So God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, get up and go with them, but you shall still do only what I tell you. So Balaam got up in the morning, sat with his donkey, and went with them. The next part, verse 22, it says, But God's anger was kindled because he was going. So God got really upset that he was going. I'm like, <laughs> but why are you getting upset because he's going? You said, if the... Now, um, if the men have come to call you, get up and go with them. But then, so he got up the next morning, sat with his donkey, and he went with them. And I'm like, I don't get <laughs> Sorry. I don't get this. I'm like, okay. And so it says, then the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an advers of advers adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey. So, you know, this is the this story where the donkey talks, right? And, you know, even this, you know, living on a farm. So I found this very interesting as well. So um, the angel is putting blocks, roadblocks in front of the donkey. Well, the donkey sees him and the donkey's like, okay, I'm going to go this other way. And, you know, Balaam's getting upset with them. You know, whipping the donkey, what are you doing? Again, the angel puts barriers. The donkey goes the other way. Gets upset, <laughs> whipping the donkey, like, dude, what are you doing? And this is just so funny to me. Um, oh, where does it say? And the, and the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all of your life until this day? Have I never accustomed, have been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. And I'm like, Okay, apparently this is like an everyday thing, occurrence of him talking to his donkey, right? I mean, it's <laughs> not like... Just get on top. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like no big deal. So I'm like thinking through that and I had to laugh and chuckle because... You know, honestly, I, I mean, I don't know. Melanie probably talks to Tessie, and Tessie totally talks to her. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's probably no, like, you know, this thing of you hear Melanie out there talking. Well, she's probably talking to the cow, and the cow's talking back to her. And so I'm like, you know, this just must be just, you know, you're, you're, you're surrounded by your livestock then, you know. Your life is your livestock. How to make your living and how to, you know, put food on your tables. I mean, you're, you communicate with your animals. So I could totally be like, yeah, I totally understand this, like, you know, thing back and forth to him. Um, but what really stood out to me was he was getting so upset with this donkey, and he says, because you made a mockery of me. And so I'm like, okay. So you're, t you're saying I'm not going with you to this king, because I'm going to hear what the Lord says to me. So he's a prophet, and he knows that God speaks through him, right? That he can't per be persuaded with all silver and gold and all these riches. So he's pretty dedicated to the Lord. And, you know, God says, if they call on you, you can go with them. So then we go to the morning he gets up, saddles his donkey. Well, then, you know, it says that God was angry with him. The angel intervenes to steer him. And... His response to the donkey is, you're made a mockery of me. So now I'm like, okay, so you're standing for the Lord, and you are, I'm only going to hear what he has to say, no matter how I'm persuaded, but I'm really, you know, offended when you're making a mockery in front of these people, because obviously I'm saying that 
well, they're actually kind of worth something, you know, of, well, I'm, I'm, you're embarrassing me in front of them. Well, you know, you kind of like, how, how often do we do that? That we're, you know, no, this is, I'm this way, you know, this is how this is and stuff. And then you kind of get into this mindset and then you're kind of looking at other people and you're like, oh, well, don't embarrass me. You know, and I think about like, okay, how are we with our children? You know, it's, you know, we, we teach them to act a certain way and to behave a certain way and stuff. But then when we're out in public and they do something, you're like, don't embarrass me or something like that. But it's like, well, wait a minute, but how are you any different than what you are at home or, you know, something like that? Like, well, how are these people any different? So it's like all these things, like all this thought process was going through my head as I'm reading this whole, you know, this thing that's happening. And, and then I'm still like, on the backside, I'm like, Lord, what in the world are you really asking him to do? So then he says, and the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw that the angel of the Lord was standing in the way as he, as his drawn sword, with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and laid himself at face down. And then the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your behavior was obstinate and contrary to me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away from me, I would have certainly killed you by now, or killed you, certainly killed you now, and let her live. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. But now, if you, but now, if my going displeases you, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but you shall speak only what I tell you. So after reading that part, God was making it extremely clear that everything is done by my hand. It is nothing that you can do. It's nothing of your behavior or who you think you are or how holy or connected to God you think you are. It is literally by the hand of God that everything takes place. And, you know, thinking through all this and then, and then we'll get into, you know, really what God spoke through him. Because what God ended up speaking through Balaam is, is historical. It literally points to the future. So this is such a huge ordeal that it needs to be everything is about the glory of God and nothing else. Nothing else. And I think about our times and where we are right now. And... That it is, we are just at this place that we need to draw near to him on a very, very personal level. And it needs to be, because this was just between, this was a dialogue between him and God. And it was only to be very direct on speaking to this king to saying, this is what the future is going to look like. To where it's written in the word of God for us to read for generations to come after. And thinking that. All of our lives have an impact on God's kingdom. What we say, how we say it, how we react, what we're doing is not about us. It's not about our little decision that we think we're making. It's not about how important or non-important we are. It's literally of where do you stand with your relationship with God on a very personal level, one-on-one -on -one relationship, the two of you, are you hearing exactly what he wants you to hear or are you getting in the way? Are you paying attention to only him and what he's saying in your life to give you the answers you're seeking or are you more concerned about what other people are thinking? Are you really hearing what he's saying or are you just assuming, well, he told me to go. Well, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. Because I'm like, God apparently didn't actually, they didn't actually say, come with us, I guess. At that point in the morning because maybe God wouldn't have been angry because he just got up in the morning packed his donkey and started going um I mean that's how I see it is that how you see it yeah okay so 
Um, so it was just kind of having that of making sure that when God calls or God is speaking, um, it's important. It's important for not just you, it's important for generations to come. It is somehow going to be impacting the future, the future of God's kingdom, the future of your, your life, your children, your grandchildren, everything is, is history. It's his story. He is writing this and our lives are intertwined in that. And I always look at life as my life is a part of this ginormous tapestry that he's writing. And every thread in that tapestry is so important. And it has to be put in at just the right time and pulled out at just the right time. So that way all of these threads can come together. When you look back, you see this most magnificent masterpiece. And it can only be done by such precise intertwining of those threads. And that, and every time I think about life and how it interacts with somebody else and how it affects what I do today <coughs> might have an effect on two or three generations from now. And so thinking about this in this little ordeal that happened with, you know, his donkey and him really hearing and God saying, I need you to speak only what I tell you, only what I tell you. So now we're going to move into 23 and pretty much 23 through 24 is oracles. And oracles are this discourse where God is given um, visions or given, you know, information that is letting him know what is to happen, what is to come. And so I'm just going to read through bits and parts of, of these oracles that really stood out to me. So the first oracle, well, for, before he speaks the oracles, they prepare seven altars and offer up a bull and a ram for each altar. And so I kind of like looked into that because before every alt, every oracle, he sets up these, these altars. And so then, you know, researching the altars. Today, our altar is taking the time of saying, God, I want to hear from you. I'm pushing away everything else and I want to hear directly from you. I'm, I'm pushing away the, the, the social media. I'm pushing away, you know, my kids interfering. I'm pushing away my work. I'm pushing away this, everything that boggles your mind. And you are literally having this time with God, quiet time. You're getting in the word and you're saying, God, clear my mind. I want to hear from you. And you're, you're looking for an answer. You're, you're, you're searching for something that you need an answer to, that you need to hear from God about something that's going on. You have to clear your mind. You have to create that altar, that, that connection between you and God. Because if you have this other stuff going on, you're not going to get the answer that you're wanting. Your dog is going to come and start talking to you and saying, did you stop what you were doing? And then, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, the cow's going to come and say, are you listening? Are you listening, Valley? <laughs> so... Now I have pigs that talk to me, so like the goats don't really talk to me anymore. Now my pigs talk to me, but anyways. So, so that was really interesting. Every time before God came and spoke to him, he made the king prepare this altar. And, um, and I just found that interesting because it was, we're, we're, we're opening up this door to hearing directly from God. And so in this first oracle, the, the area that stood out was, how shall, this is verse 8, uh, chapter 24, how shall I curse those whom God has not cursed? Because remember, he's asking God, please curse the Israelites. You know, I, I don't like them being here. I don't want them coming in and taking over my land. Can you please curse them so, you know, they don't do that? Or how can I violently denounce those the Lord has not denounced? On to verse 9. The second part, behold, the people of Israel shall dwell alone and will not be reckoned among the nations. Well, where are the Israelites? Everywhere. We are everywhere. We are spread out everywhere. We dwell everywhere. 
and we cannot be reckoned with among nations. I just found that very, very interesting. And verse 10, second half, it says, Let me die the death of righteousness, those who are upright and in right standing with God, and let my end be like this. Right? And I found that very interesting. So then it's got two references. One was Psalms 3737. Mark the blameless man who is spiritually complete and behold the upright who walks in moral integrity. There is a good future for the man of peace because his life of honor blesses one's descendants. I found that very interesting. That the... Let me die the death of righteous, and let my end be like this. Another reference to this is Revelations 14, 13. Then I heard the distant word of a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed, happy, prosperous, to be admired, are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, yes, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, so that they may rest and have relief from their labors and their deeds do follow them. And that was all of really pondering who am I personally with my relationship with God? Where do I personally stand? And where are we one-on-one -on -one together personally? And, and I think all of this is, where is that personal connection that you and only you have with your creator? And it was really interesting. Um, got there. Shane had, we were talking about this this weekend, and Shane had, pointed out that he heard um, somebody say, we are now in a time, there are so many gods, that you need to make sure you're being clear on who you're referencing as God. God, the creator of heaven and earth. So I was like, hmm, we just use the word, you know, our God. Well, you know what? People have a lot of other gods right now. So we reference to God, the creator of heaven and earth. So, those are things that stood out to me from the first oracle. So, after the first oracle, the king of Moab was like, okay, well, I didn't like that answer. So, <laughs> let me show you another area. So, they're standing, they were standing at this tall mount on this mountaintop. Let me, let me, let me take you over here and I'm going to show you how mass you know, this, these people are like, come over here and see, like, I want you to really get an idea of this is way too many. This is way out of control and something needs to be done about it. Right. We are way out of control as Christians and something needs to be done about us, isn't it? So takes them to another place again, build me an altar, build an altar. Let's, let's have this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, connection with God. Let's hear directly from God. So the second oracle, here's what stood out to me. Verse 19, chapter 23. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good and fulfill it? Behold, I have received his command to bless Israel. He has blessed and cannot reverse it. God is not, God has not observed wickedness in Jacob, for he is forgiven, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a second. Walking through the wilderness, the Israelites have angered God 
a lot. Like, time and time again, he has, you know, the last thing before this little encounter happened, he actually opened up the ground and swallowed, like, 24,000 people, you know, Israelites, because they were mumbling and complaining about, about not having water. Um, so I think about all of the grumbling and complaining we do, and we totally lose sight of, one, who God is and what he's done for us. Not just on a personal level with your life, but just us in general as human beings, what he's done for us, where we stand right now. Why, why, are, why, can't, we, why can't we fix our eyes on him? Why do we have to be so self-centered that we are so consumed or, you know, consumed of, well, well, I don't have this. 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 Okay, did you forget about what you do have? Apparently so. And that's exactly how the Israelites were the entire time through the wilderness. The, the, the first generation or the generation that came out of Egypt because of how they acted, they never even got to see the promised land. Because of their distrust in God. After like he had proven himself how many times? I mean, there were some pretty <laughs> remarkable miracles of parting the Red Sea to allowing them to walk through, getting them out of slavery. But every single time, they would complain and say, we would have been better off if we stayed in Egypt. Just take the least of this. Yeah. I mean, how often is it that, well, I would be better off if this would have happened. I would have been better off if this would have happened. Well, I would have been better off if this would have happened. Really? Really? Did you, did, uh, do you really sit down and do you really go back to that situation? Where your mind was? Where you were? Really? Was that better? So, um, so God will not undo and he does not lie. He made a promise. He is going to keep his promise. That promise that he made then is the same exact promise that still stands today, and it will be fulfilled. So, after all the things, all the wickedness, it says, God has not observed wickedness in Jacob, for he is forgiven, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. You recognize all of your flaws and all of your mistakes and everything that you do on a daily basis. God does not. God sees this is the story that I have written in my book of life about you. This is what I see. I already wrote it. I plan on fulfilling it. But you don't see that. You are only looking at all the other stuff. That's not what he sees. He doesn't know those things. He doesn't remember them. He blesses and cannot reverse it. Everybody's life is chosen. He has called you. He cannot reverse it. But he does give us free will. He does give us the choice. No different than he gave every one of those Israelites the choice. And most of them chose not to, not to follow, not to believe in the promised land, not to see all of the wonderful things that he did for them. Today, people do not see what God has done in our past. They're so focused on the chaos and the confusion and the fear and everything else that Satan tries to blindfold us with that you do not see what God is doing. God is doing some incredible things incredible things for his kingdom right now. It is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And most people do not see it. Because they're so blindfolded, blindfolded by their selfishness and their greed and their self-pity. So he says he cannot see, he has not seen the trouble of Israel. The Lord their God is with Israel. And the shout of their king is among the people. Who's their king? Jesus. Jesus. 
He was pointing to Jesus. Then the shout of their king is among them. So, when it says rejoicing here, rejoicing with them, nice. <laughs> That's much better. That is much better. All right, and then on the, the end part, on verse 24 of that oracle, it says, Behold, a people rises up like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. He will not lie down until he devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. This is an oracle. This is something that happened before the Israelites went into the promised land. God was already giving the signs of what is to come later on in the future, even the end times. Yeah. God is always, always, always pointing everybody to the end, to where we belong. This entire Bible, our entire lives, every generation is all pointing to him. It always has been from the very, 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 very beginning from the moment earth was created and it will carry through to the end and he is constantly pointing to that direction and here it is again. So on to the fourth or the third um, oracle again, creating that altar. So here are a couple things that stood out to me. Um, verse 7, chapter 24, verse 7, water, that is great blessings will flow from the his buckets and his offspring will live by many waters. Okay, so that severely pointed out to me because right now, one, <laughs> her visions, my visions, we've had these visions for a very long time, and most people that we are speak or hearing from um, prophetically are all talking about water. Water, water, water. Rivers, floods, um, wells. wells, everything is water. So when I read that, I got so excited, like underlined and everything, because I'm like, water. Definition of water is great blessing. Great blessings, great blessings will flow from his buckets and his offspring will live by many waters. Your life is a blessing when you are connected to him. God, Christ said, I am, I, you drink from me, drink from water that will never, you will never go dry. Your mouth will never go dry, right? He will fill it up. Yes, fill it up, running over. It says, I will flow, the buckets will flow to his offspring that will live by many waters. Your, your life and the decision that you are making right now in following Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the water that will, that will just fill every part of your body and your life forever flows not just in you but your offspring. And they will live by the waters, many of them. This is something that goes on generation after generation after generation. You do not have to follow the same family line of curse that has been upon your family anymore. You have the choice to disconnect yourself from that, say, this is who I am going to be in Christ. I am not choosing to follow the way of the world. I'm not choosing to live under this anymore. I'm not choosing allow, to allow Satan and his little demons to mess with my brain and everything else that goes on, your body and everything. You have got to stand up for who God created you to be, and that is a child of God, and you need to take the authority that he's been given, that he's given you. Amen. And the blessings of the water are flowing. And let me tell you, that water is the Holy Spirit, and it is taking over. These waters are filling up everywhere. It is just happening everywhere, everywhere. And so I just, I really, really, really want you to grasp onto what is happening, the tug that's happening in your heart. Satan is probably attacking you like never before. If you have been living in a certain lifestyle, he's going to come here, come to try to devour you. He'll seal and destroy. You have got to stand against that and know who you are in Christ. The word of God 
the Bible, the Word of God is the only thing that is going to get you through your battle with Satan. Amen. The only thing. You've got to use that as your weapon. Get in it. The Word of God is flowing and giving you exactly the answers that you need to hear to being able to combat whatever it is that you're up against at the moment in time. So that was just huge for me. So later on down, on verse 9, uh, chapter 24, it says, He bowed down to rest. He lies down as a lion and as a lioness who dares to arouse him. Who dares to arouse him? Blessed of God is he who blesses you and cursed of God is he who curses you. Meaning, Satan is going to try to attack you. He's going to try to curse you. But he will be cursed. And we already know that. And those that are putting blessings that God blesses, he who blesses will be blessed. Okay? It's, it's coming. It's there. Growl onto it. The promise is there. Fourth oracle the oracle, so here is what this, I underline this because I end up realizing he ex explains what is this oracle? An oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty. That is the oracle that was given. God, God is speaking to people on brand new levels right now. He is speaking to people in dreams and in visions through animals. <laughs> um, God is speaking. You need to not think, hmm, that was a coincidence or, no. boy, that was that was weird. I need, like We are in a time that you need to say, okay, that was God and I need to pay attention to what he's telling me. We are at that time. And so, and it's he who acknowledges the most high. You have got to acknowledge who your creator is. You've got to acknowledge your savior. You've got to acknowledge that God, your father, loves you so much. And he is giving you this opportunity to allow your life to be transformed and blessed and given the opportunity of the life that he has written out for you. This is the time. He is there. So, I know. So, verse 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star has come forth from the descendants of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of the descendants of Israel. He shall crush the head of forehead of Moab. Okay, think about not just crush the forehead of Moab, but crush the head of the, the, of the serpent and destroy all of the sons of Sheth. Who is he talking about? <laughs> I love it. It's so good. I mean, I am just like, again, there it is. It's Jesus. It's the star. It's him. He, what did he come to do? To crush and destroy the curse that was put upon this earth. It's, he did it. It's done. This, this happened before the Israelites walked into the promised land. They're still in the wilderness. They still are not in the land of flowing with milk and honey. Because <laughs> they're being ridiculous. And here we are. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> Pointing to Christ. Pointing to Christ. Verse 19 says, One from the descendant of Jacob shall have dominion, and he will destroy the remnant of the city. Right there. Yes. The, they, you know, it was, he's probably, you know, speaking these things to this king, and this king is probably like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but God did. Because God knew where this would be printed and that this was spread through in the entire world in every single language for everybody to read 
over and over and over and over and over again from generation to generation to generation to realize that everything is pointing to him. Everything. Everything points to Christ. Everything. Always. Fifth oracle. So these kind of get shorter. I didn't highlight it under the fifth or anything under the fifth oracle. Nothing stood out. It was just the uh, uh, Amalek was the first of the neighboring nations to oppose the Israelites after they had left Egypt. But his end shall be in destruction. So pretty yeah. much saying this is what's getting ready to happen to these people. Happen, the sixth, really pretty much the same thing. He's saying these are these surrounding nations. They're getting ready to be destroyed. The seven, <coughs> um, Alias, who can live unless God has ordained it? Good and bad. Who can live unless God ordained it? Everything has a purpose, good and bad. Pharaoh had a purpose. His heart had to be hardened. God had to show um, of all of those um, all those signs, the miracle, whatever they were. Yeah, yeah, those things. He proved himself, proved himself against all of their gods. Every one of those proved himself against one of his gods. Again, all of this will happen again during the time of tribulation at the end, right? All of this is pointing. Who can live unless God ordained it? Nothing is happening without God knowing what is happening. Please remember, God is in control. We can't sit there and say, gosh, why is all this stuff happening? How can God let this stuff happen? He's not shocked or surprised. The Israelites were saying the same okay. thing, and they wanted to go back to slavery. If you're saying that, you want to stay in slavery. That's what I'm saying. But I want to be out of this. Yeah. All right, so those were the seven oracles, and I found it interesting it was seven oracles. And so I want to add this little side note that I found very interesting. I just got done reading a book um, by Jonathan Cain and the oracle. And God spoke through him, through oracles, through these visions and dreams, all of them in our time where we are right now, pointing towards what has happened and how history is just repeating itself, how the word of God, he's pulling scripture out that God has shown him and pointing to, this is what I said, this is what that result was. This is what I said, this is what this result is. So the book was just so eye-opening to me of me having understanding of God is doing the same exact thing that he's done in the Bible you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years ago, this is over, oh my gosh, this is, this is a really, really, really long time. Like 2,000 years ago was, you know, where Jesus came, and this was way, no. way, way before then. So just God is doing the same thing. God has never, ever changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, okay? Everything is the same. You want to know what's happening? Read the Bible. So, then this stood out to me. So we have these, these oracles. We have these signs, right? They're us, for us, to read these signs of saying, this is pointing to Christ. This is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to keep my promise. And I just, I am like, <coughs> Lord, and here we are again. We're so, we're just so human. So it says, this is verse 25, or chapter 25. I'm just going to skip in different places. The people began to play the prostitutes with the women of Moab. And now I realize that, you know, the prostitutes um, mentioned all through the Bible is, you know, a prostitute is just intriguing and, you know, um, um, playing with your mind. And, ooh, you know, come on, you know, wouldn't this be fun? Causing us to sin, causing us to fall into under sin. Wow, it sounds really good, and you know, and yeah, exactly. So, so that's exactly what had happened. They persuaded, you know, these people of, you know, ooh, look at look at what we have here. Wouldn't this be so much fun? And uh, of course, you know, the Israelites are just, you know, the Israelites. They're us. We're human, and we just get so caught up in stuff because it just sounds so good and the devil just does such a good job just making it sound so perfect it's like yes that sounds like great and so what did they do 
For they invited the Israelites to the sacrifices of their gods, and the Israelites ate food offered to idols and bowed down to Moab gods. And so Israel joined themselves to Baal of Pure, pure in worship. Oh, isn't that just so great? It was just so wonderful, right? I mean, it just sounded so good. And there's no harm in that. And it's not that big of a deal. So again, we just said, he, he, he proved himself over and over. What? I know. I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, you know, you got to step back from it and be like, well, that was really dumb. Yeah, it really was. And so what dumb decision did you do today? Exactly. That's what I was just thinking. It's no different. It's no different. It's no different. You can't say, well, um, well, we're not like that. Yes, we are. Every single day. Every single day. So, of course, God gets very angry. Yes. So, so angry. This is big. Take all of the leaders of the people who have committed the sin with the Moabites and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And so Moses said to the judges of Israel, each one of you kill, must kill his men who have joined themselves with Baal of Pure in worship. That's it, huh? You, you messed up? You're done. Right? You're done. See ya. You, you screwed up again. And, you know, and I, and I want to say that, oh, well, God doesn't do that now. You know, that, that's not that bad. I just want to say that God's wrath is going to come. Okay? Us sugarcoating, and it's not that bad, and it's no big deal, and, well, you know, nobody knows about that. Or that wasn't that big of a deal. To God, it was a big deal. To God, it is a big deal. To God, he is examining your heart. I just want to let you know. And you feel it. You know it. You've got that conviction. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. It's there. You know it. Yeah. It's no different. It's no different. You can't close the book and say that didn't. That doesn't involve me. Yes, it does. It involves every single one of us every single day. And without Jesus, that's why before that, it points to Jesus. Without him, there's nothing. There's nothing. Then one of the Israel, and this gets, gets me because this is just, you know, our ignorance. Then one of the Israelites came and presented to his relatives a Moabite woman. Oh, look at what I have. She's so wonderful. I just, I love her so much. And we're just going to have a great life together. In the sight of Moses and the whole congregation of the Israelites, while they were weeping over God's judgment at the doorway at the tent of meeting of the tabernacle. Before the presence of God, you're pretty much throwing it in his face of, look what I got, look what I did, and I really don't care what you have to say. This is my life. This is how I want to live it. It's my choice and my decision, and I really don't care what the result is. Okay. No problem. But guess what? There was this man. How do you say his name? Which one? Phineas. Phineas. When Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw this, he left the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both him, them through the body, the man of Israel and the woman. Okay, so that was pretty harsh. He like, he's like, he got, he got upset, right? Then the plague on the Israelites stopped. Nevertheless, those Israelites who died in the plague, 24,000. 24,000 still ended up dying before somebody stepped in and said, no, this can't happen. So I want to point something out before I move forward. Every single time the Israelites screwed up, Moses and Aaron went to God 
and begged him not to destroy them. They went and they interceded for them. Every single time. They had to remind God, please don't forget your promises. Remember what you said? Remember what you did at taking them out of Egypt? If you do this now, you know, everybody's going to make a mockery of them. Oh, look it, the God brought them out and then God not annihilated them. Every single time somebody interceded. Somebody is interceding for you. Somebody is saying, God, please do not let your wrath, your anger come upon this person. You're praying it for your children. You're praying it for your loved ones. You're praying it for your person that you're, you work with. You're praying it for somebody. Just like I said last week, every single person in your life on every level, pray. It's that simple. You have to. You have to intercede for them. You have to stand in the gap for them. You are not fighting against flesh and blood. This is not against flesh and blood. This was Satan. This was his work of enticing those people into following. Our nation is under the judgment that it is right now because we have been enticed to follow something that we should have never been following. And nobody stood in the gap and interceded for us to stop what was happening. And I'm going to say, right. the church did not stand in the gap and do what it was supposed to be doing in stopping all of the stuff that Satan was doing. Now the church is rising up. People are rising up and fighting back. Children, parents are fighting for their children. People are fighting for their, their county. People are fighting for their state. And people are fighting for this nation. But it's sad that it has had to come to this to make all this happen. All this crazy stuff that has happened is by no accident. God had enough. He had enough. He wants to see all of his people, just like he wanted to see all of Israel saved. These, This 24,000 that got killed, this was after the first generation had to, had to wait and die 40 years in the wilderness because they couldn't enter. It's a lot of people. We keep talking about like numbers. It's a lot of people saying all these numbers. But the numbers now, I mean, this was just some small portion of the world. We fill up the entire world now. And God is trying to be like, will you people please wake up? Please wake up. Please wake up and save yourself. I'm here. I'm waiting. I'm knocking. I'm begging. Will somebody please answer the door? Will you please answer the door? God is knocking. Jesus is like, hello, I'm here. And I really, 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 really want to help you. Okay. So. Then God, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Caiaphas, what is his name? Phineas, Pax, Phineas. I'm sorry. Phineas, Phineas, Phineas. I was like, it's really late, we're really tired. It's okay, Phineas. Phineas, Phineas the son of Elzar, the son of Aaron, the priest, of the priest, was turned has turned my wrath away from the Israelites because he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not destroy the Israelites in my jealousy. He turned God's wrath away. Do you know how many people are praying over this nation to turn his wrath around? A lot. Do you know how many people are praying for you right now? A lot. I'm one of them. I pray for every single one of you that watch this. So that God did not destroy the Israelites. He's jealous. He only wants your heart. And only your heart, every single part of it, or he wants all of you and in your heart and every single heart. He does not want you sharing your heart with other things. He's jealous. Very, very, very jealous. He created you. 
He loves you. He wants to spend the rest of eternity with you. And he's fighting for you. But he's giving you the opportunity to choose him. He's not going to force you to do it. It is your choice. And he is giving every single opportunity there is for you to surrender, for you to let go of all the stuff, all the garbage, all the baggage, everything that you're allowing to get in the way between the two of you, which is all stuff that Satan's using. But there is somebody praying for you. And this was beautiful. He says, I give. Why can't I get his name? Well, Phineas. 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 Phineas, my covenant of peace. God made a covenant because of what he did. God made a covenant with this nation because of what the people did to fight for this nation. There's a covenant that has been made with God over our nation. And it is worth fighting for. And it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Because he was jealous for the unique honor and the respect owed to his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. An everlasting covenant of priesthood. There is a jealousy that is stirred up in the hearts of so many people. And I hope that there is a jealousy that is stirred up into every single one of your hearts that are watching this. And you're willing to stand up and you're willing to fight for the kingdom of God. Because it is totally worth fighting for. For yourself and for the generations to come. This translation said that he was full of zeal. When you think of zeal, it's like he was ready. He's going to do it. <laughs> I like that word. I do feel. I'm feel full of zeal. Most definitely. Most definitely. So at the very end of chapter 25, then God spoke to Moses saying, Provoke hostilities with the Moabites and attack them. For they harass you with their tricks, the tricks with which they have deceived you in a matter of the Baal of Pir, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Median, their sister, who was killed on the day of the plague because of Baal. Provoke hostility with the Midianites and attack them. Hostility is being provoked. Why? Why is hostility being provoked in our nation? Because we are being harassed by the tricks that are deceiving people. So, Hostility is being provoked. It needs to be provoked. Because if it's not being provoked, then what is there worth fighting for? If you're not being provoked, and you're not realizing the tricks and the different things that are happening around you and around this nation, then you really don't care. You don't care for your life, for your children's life, and for the future. All I seen was this, is that God is fighting for us. He's there. Every resource is available. And all we have to do is grab it. And he's willing to open every door and fight every obstacle and do everything necessary for your life and for the future of every generation to come after. That's what I have to say about that.
what I want to say in, in reply, very shortly, very, very shortly, <laughs> is that think on these things. Think on the things, if you take the time to hear us speak, think on them. Whatever other pastors you listen to through the week, whatever podcast you listen to through the week, if God is putting these things in your path, you need to ponder them and you need to think on them and you need to, to pick this up. And um, this week I was actually um, studying the word um, Selah. It's very prominent in the Psalms and I think in like Habakkuk. Um, and it's actually used in the Bible. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but like the word Amen is used in the Bible a couple of times. And then we use the word Hallelujah a lot. And it's in there just a little bit more than a couple of times. This word Selah, you know, if we've got amen this many times and hallelujah this many times, it's in there this many times. But we don't really think about it very much. And that's probably because when you break down the etymology of words, I know everybody, I'm always breaking down the words. There's a big struggle. Um, people don't really know exactly what they meant at that time by that word, but there's enough information to glean a little bit of here and a little bit from here because some people will say, oh, it means this. You can't really do that because the etymology doesn't work great. But whether it means, you know, that there was a pause, you know, well, why would we pause? Well, because we need to ponder, we need to think. Um, and, and some things it actually breaks on it's super close to a word that means that you want to raise something up. And even so much as, you know, talking about the lifting up of hands and the raising up and giving thanks to him, um, it's, it's an acknowledgement of what is in here. We've got to take that time to pause and to think on the things that he is putting into your life right now and the things that he is speaking into your life right now. Don't just say, well, that was really cool. That was real cool. And, and. You know, I'll go tell Terry tomorrow, oh, I heard this, this was really cool. It has to be more than that. We have to ponder these things and think on them and take them to his feet and ask what it is that he wants us to do with the things that we're learning in our lives and that, because he's preparing us for something. I spoke last week that each of us is given a gift and he may be honing that in different ways or maybe he's not revealed yet a gift that you need to be doing. And if you're starting to hear something right now in your life, you need to stop and ponder on it and take the time to ask, why did he want me to hear this today? What does this mean for my life? And what does it mean for those that I need to be praying about or speaking into or doing for and reaching out and doing good works for him? Pause and take the time to think about the things that he's speaking to you today and yesterday and this week. So. And, and also in that is, you know, understanding that every part of what God is giving you is to, is to transform you to be like him. The, the whole process of us being here is not just, oh, we're here to pass through. While we're passing through, we are being transformed back into his likeness. So everything, we, we have to undo all of the garbage that's been put on us from birth and whatever, you know, layer after layer after layer after layer. Most of it is generational layer. All that has to be wiped away so that we can be made white as snow back into his likeness, pure. And so part of this process of this personal relationship with him and when he's speaking to you and he's giving you information or if something's stirred up into you, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying because ultimately he wants you to be like him. So remember that. Remember that. This is a transformation process. I'm transformed every single day. Every day, something pulls up to me, or, you know, is pointed out to me, and I need to say, yep, I need to work on that, or, yep, you're right, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to change that, we're going to, we're going to make that change, so I encourage that as well.
figure out what that is that God is telling you. Because after you finish that one, he's going to give you another one. Like, this is, like, through your entire life. You're never to the point of saying, like, ah, got it all together. There you go. You never I've arrived. Yeah. going to hang out here. <laughs> no. Never <laughs> hanging out anywhere. Because that's when Satan's going to come in and say, ah, ah. Yeah. Knock you right, lick you exactly. right off there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. Awesome. I pray that you guys have a, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> a blessed week. Yes, may God's blessings be with you all week long. Yes. Amen. How do you spell John Henry? How do you spell John? And learn how to spell John Henry. Yeah. How do you spell John Henry?